Welcome to Living Faith with Dr. Charles Baxter, recorded live at Christ Community Church, 1364 North Hillcrest Road, Vincennes, Indiana. And now, here's today's message. I may brought a Bible this morning. Okay? Start bringing your Bible. You're like a soldier without a sword or without a gun, without any kind of weapon. This is your weapon. And we need it in these times. I'm going to, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. I'm going to read a few extra verses, but I gave 18 and 19. Then you just follow me and I'll guide you where I want to go. And behold, some men were carrying a bed. And I'll tell you about the bed here in a minute. A man who was paralyzed, and they were trying to bring him in and set him down in front of Jesus. And not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down through the towels with his stretcher right in the center in front of Jesus. Jump down to the second part of verse 24. And Jesus said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise and take up your stretcher and go home. And at once he rose up before them and took up what he had been lying on and went home doing what? Glorifying God. Never forget when God does something good, you give him the glory for it. Amen. Now, who here doesn't need encouragement? Everybody needs encouragement. Even preachers need encouragement, you know? People in the nursing homes and the hospitals, mothers, fathers, young people, everybody needs encouragement. It plays a very important part in our walk with Christ. I'm reminded of an old, no comments, an old retired preacher who decided that he didn't need to ride the circuit anymore. So he's going to get rid of his one horse. And his neighbor had some interest in having a horse. He didn't have a horse. And he thought, well, you know, I'd like to have the horse and I'll take care of it. And the preacher said, well, he's, he's a good horse, you know. Um, he'll be good for you. He's easy to maintain. He's easy to take care of. Uh, he's obedient. He'd make you a good horse. And the man says, what I owe you? And the preacher said, nothing. He just, just knowing that you're going to take care of my horse for me means a lot to me. So he was encouraged. The man got on the horse, and he fits good. And he said, he got the saddles included. And every the pastor in every way tried to encourage the man that it's going to be great. He's going to have a lot of fun, you know. And he said, oh, by, by the way, there's two things I want you to remember he said, I, I always said when I wanted my horse to stop, I said amen. And then when I wanted my horse to go, I'd say praise the Lord. And he obeys that. Do you understand? The man says, well, that sounds easy enough. And about that time, the horse reared up and took off running. And that man didn't have a good seat in the saddle, and he was holding on for dear life, and he was going, stop! whoa, slow down, help me, started screaming, you know, and that horse was just a flying over creeks and through the woods and all, he was just hanging on for dear life. And then it, he remembered, he remembered and he yelled, amen, and that horse was, it stopped. And it stopped at the edge of a large ravine that looked down to a deep bottom with a little stream running through. He looked up into the clouds and said, praise the Lord. <laughs> he got him a good obedient horse, didn't he? I want you to think about something here in Luke 5. It proves how just a little encouragement can go a long way. Just a little encouragement can go a long way. You know, when people are battling something, what do they need? Encouragement. When they're struggling in the faith, what do they need? Encouragement. When they're struggling with life and what life brings at them, and life can throw so much 
at us. What do they need? Encouragement. How many students started off to college this, the, already in college, you know, and, and uh, I wonder how many of them are already calling home and saying, can I come home? You know, uh, how many of them need encouragement? They need encouragement. We all need encouragement. Someone said this, I thought it was really good. Flatter me, and I may not believe you. Criticize me, and I may not like you. Ignore me, and I may not forgive you. Encourage me, and I will not forget you. We all can change the life of somebody else with encouragement. And we all need it. You know what makes a, a bad day a, a better day? Is to go through that day and have somebody come up, put their hand on us, or smile and say, and encourage us. That can get us through. Consider these four men here. There's four men here in Luke chapter 5. And I take it these four men were friends with this man who was a paralytic. Paralytic means he had no use of his limbs. He couldn't walk. His, from his waist down particularly, he was dead. There was no feeling. And these men, apparently knew that their friend couldn't come to Jesus on his own. <laughs> There's no way. And probably after all, nobody else was going to bring him to Jesus. He couldn't even get close to Jesus. Even when Jesus was in town before and he made several visits to this area, you know, he was one that had to sit back and watch everybody else go to Jesus. But here in this story, it's what makes it so beautiful is the encouragement that is there on these pages. Here's this paralytic, and he hears that Jesus is down at this certain house, and he's preaching, and deliverance, and miracles are happening, and, and it's crowded. I mean, people are standing up all inside, all outside, hanging through the windows. Everybody wants to hear what Jesus got to say. So what did they do? They had a blanket, which they called a stretcher. But what it was is a blanket, they took a rope and they tied it around one corner and they would drape it over their shoulder. And then another guy would tie a rope and drape it and they, they would pick the guy up in the blanket with it over their shoulders and they would walk. It was an easy way to carry someone who couldn't walk. And they came and you know the, the beautiful thing is is that this man had to be elated. He had to be so excited. Because somebody cared enough to say, we're going to take you to Jesus. And I'm sure that his hope and his joy and his peace and deliverance was all in the hands of these four friends. You talk about encouragement. My goodness. But I want to share with you what it means to be an encourager. Okay. The first one is this. The word encourage in the Greek means to walk alongside of. You can't be a real good encourager unless you get involved. Unless you come alongside someone and they can see you. They can feel you. They can hear you. And they can watch that expression on your face that you're there for them. To walk alongside of. Now, the beautiful thing about this story, we don't have a lot because, you know, it's just getting to the main points. But the beautiful thing about the story, nowhere is it recorded that these four men picked him up and moaned and groaned and griped the whole way to where Jesus was. They didn't say, oh my gosh, you've been eating donuts or what? Man, you are heavy. Do we have to travel all this way? Couldn't we just go on and see if Jesus could come to you. There was no negativeness whatsoever. They kept their eye upon where they were going, and I'm sure they talked to their friend along the way. It won't be long, it won't be long, and I'm sure I could just see him smiling the whole time as they were making that way to where Jesus was. They didn't give him any false hope. They didn't make him feel worthless. They didn't say, Jesus, you know, Jesus is going to be way too busy for you. They didn't tell him that there was no way he could get in. They didn't say that. You see, you can't be a critical of people and be an encourager of people. There's no way. The, the, the two don't mix. My dad used to love cottage cheese. And until I saw what he did with cottage cheese, that almost turned me away from cottage cheese. But whenever he had cottage cheese, guess what he'd put on it? 
it looked like it snowed. He'd load it up with salt. Now let me tell you, folks, salt and cottage cheese don't work. Okay, a little pepper works, but salt, it was just covered with salt, and he, that's the way he liked it. Now, being critical, to me, is like salt, but being an encourager is like sweet. It's good tasting. You know, when others know that you are willing to help them, you may not necessarily know them very well. They may not be a relative. They may not be a friend, but the fact is that you've taken some interest in them, and when people notice that you're wanting to, to do something special for them, to encourage them, you've heard what they're going through, what they're facing maybe at work or family or whatever it is, to know that you're going to pray for them and, and do whatever you can to help them through this crisis, I'll tell you what. In verse 18 it says, in the King James, and they brought and then sought. You know what that tells me? They just didn't bring their friend and set them down with the crowd and say, we'll be back later to get you. It says they brought and then they sought, means they weren't done with just bringing him to, to Jesus, where Jesus was. They told him in the start, we're going to take you to Jesus. And that meant that whatever it took, we're going to get you right there in front of Jesus at the head of the line. I may like to get the head of the line. Preacher, when there's fried chicken, preachers love to get the head of the line. <laughs> there are many today who need to know this, and I don't know how you can get word out to them, but they need to know that they need Jesus and only what Jesus can give them. They don't need anything else. They don't need more church. They don't need more religion. They don't need more preaching. They don't need a, what they need is to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. They need more Jesus. This man just didn't need to be where everybody else was at. He needed to be where Jesus was on the inside, in the middle. And his friends knew that. Come alongside them and lead them to Jesus. I saw on the, uh, I think it was CNN or one of those national news channels. It showed a bunch of boys running around a track. Little boys, elementary boys. And they were just running their elbows or just a flying. And they were running around this track, you know. And, and they were coming around the fourth corner and they were all still in a big mass. You know, nobody was really standing out and. And all of a sudden, one boy, who they identified as he was a special needs boy, he had kept up as long as he could with his buddies. But when he came around the fourth turn, his feet began to stumble, his legs got weak, and he fell down. And here these, they were probably less than maybe 100 yards from the finish line. And here's this mass going, and the boys looked back and they saw that special needs boy down on the ground and they all stopped. You know what they did? They all turned around and went back and picked them up so they could all finish together. That is encouragement. That is what we need to do. When we see somebody falling, when we see somebody crying, when we see somebody that's bruised by this world and, and they just don't know what to do, that's when we ought to step up and go to them and help them to finish and get through this thing. Not to look back and say, well, we hope you can get up and come eventually. They don't want to hear your encouragement. They want to feel it. They want to know it. Now you talk about a moving scene. Who do you know right now? Who do you know? Maybe it's you this morning that needs some encouragement pretty bad. You want somebody to come alongside you this morning and love you and help you. Secondly, to be an encourager, you've got to have a positive outlook. You know what? I'm not going to ask how many of you are positive people. You've got to have a positive attitude. You know one of the very first things that I often pick up on Sunday mornings, and I have to look in the mirror and work on my own sometimes too. 
But the first thing I look at, I don't look at what people's got on. I, don't, I, I look at their attitude. Is their attitude joyful? Is it surrendering? Is it expecting? Is there a want there? You know, it, it, sometimes over the, I've, over the years, I told my wife that when you look at how some people come to church, you're wondering, are, are they going to a funeral or are they going to a worship service? You know, there's no joy in their face. They're, 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 they, they just act like, I would rather be 20 other places than in the house of God. And let me reverse that. There is no other place better to be than in the house of God. There's nothing out there that's better than being in the house of God. So the problem is not with God. It's, it's probably with us. But anyway, you can really help somebody come along and you get beside them. And you've got a good attitude. You know, I, I, I love verse 19. You know, these friends weren't griping or fussing or frowning or moaning, but I can say that, in, that all the way, in verse 19, and all the way there, they couldn't find a way in. Do you notice it in the King James? They couldn't find a way in. So they found a way up. You know what that says? If what you're doing is not doing enough, then try something else. If who you know and who you love needs Christ in their life or they need Christ in, in, in their walk and their daily activities, if what you're doing is not doing is what you hope it would do, then do it something else. Do it. Get in there and get, do something more. Don't just stop and say, oh, well, I ring the doorbell once. Nobody came. Let's go. I took a man on visitation one time with me, and he'd not been on visitation. And I said, now, we're going to pray. We're going to go and, and uh, ring the doorbell and, and knock until they come. And, and then we're just going to invite them to church and ask them if they know Christ. And, and he goes, oh, 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 he was very nervous. He said, okay. So we get out of the car. We go up there, you know, and, and, and he rings the doorbell, and he goes, okay, let's go. I said, wait a second. You didn't even give him time to come. come nobody's here. And we got, I was still standing there, and he stepped down, and the door opened up. And this lady said, yes. And the guy was in, he goes, oh, he wanted to be over with. He wanted it to be over, just done. But he, he said, I like that. I like that. you got to give them a chance. You, you know, if, if it doesn't work the first time, then try something else. But they couldn't find a way in, it says, and they found a way up. You know, people look for other ways today. They look for other ways. Well, as long as I give something to the church, as long as I take communion, and as long as I go to church, you know, God ought to be, God's taking points, you know. God's taking points, and, and you know, that ought to count for something. But guess what? The only thing that counts is if you've got Christ in your life. That, that's the only thing that counts. Everything else should complement the, the place of Christ in your life. You know, you do everything else because you love Christ. You give because you love Christ. You go to church because you love Christ. You sing, though some of you have a, they tr you try. You sing because you love Christ. You shake each other's hands. You fellowship. You play music. You sing music. You do it because you love Christ. These men did what they did because they loved Christ. You know, when they saw that crowd, I don't know about you, but I know how I am with restaurants. But when they saw that crowd, I, I, would, have just, I would have just said, I'm not going into that. How many like it with restaurants? You get to a restaurant you love, and, you're, and the, the line is, is already out the door and down the sidewalk. And people are still getting out and going and getting in line. Really? Now, my kids, well, they'd stand all day. They stood in lines at Disney World like it was nothing. It was killing me. You know, I want in. I want to be seated. I don't want to stand outside. Can you imagine how many people that day wanted to see Jesus because they wanted him to touch them in their lives somehow, some way? I just said, oh, well, the, too big a crowd for me. Well, why else are you going to go? The only thing that man needed, only Jesus could give. And the only thing people today need is what Jesus can give. You know, well, she's going to go. You can go to 20 churches and not find what you need. But you come to Jesus one time and he'll give you everything. A lot of people don't understand that. 
A negative attitude and an outlook don't make a meal any better. My kids have said, oh, come on, Papa. Come on, Dad. You know, he never said old man. <laughs> they knew better. I wait. Oh, by the time we got seated, I didn't care if I ate or not. I was so upset. Isn't that true? Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> but when you come along with somebody, it gives them the strength to go on. Here's the next one, thirdly. To be an encourager, you've got to put faith in others. Put some faith in them. In other words, these men, the fact that they were carrying him to Jesus, said something about their own faith. It said that they had faith in this Jesus. It said that they had faith that he was going to do something. They had faith that if they could get him closer to Jesus, that something was going to happen. They believed it for this man. They wanted it for this man. And they would take it for this man. I tell you, people can reach heights today if they know others believe in them. Do you know how unstable roofs were in the Bible days? You know, some people, I don't, or I, I, I don't know, depending on how, the age of the house, I don't like walking on the roof. I've heard of people falling through roofs and, you know, and it's no, it's no joyful experience. But to have four men, five men are up on a roof. This isn't tile and two by fours and eight, you know, six by or eight by twos, two by six. That, that, none of that's up there. It's, it's kind of a flat roof. And you imagine all those people below and Jesus is below. Why, you could fall through that roof and fall on Jesus and, oh, just a terrible scene. They, they, they were determined that somehow they had a plan that if they could pull this way and pull this way and pull this way, that they could, they could get that man lowered down there in front of Jesus. Now listen to me. It took faith to do that. It took faith. You know, others need to know you believe in them. I had a little note someone put on my desk I thought was cute. A wife asked her husband, do you love me? He goes, uh-huh. Do you like my hair? Uh-huh. Do you like my outfit? Uh-huh. Do you think I'm pretty? Uh-huh. Do you think my lips are as soft as rose petals? Uh-huh. She said, oh, honey, you say the most beautiful things. You know, others need to know. <laughs> they got to know somehow that you love them. In Deuteronomy 138, Moses encouraged Joshua. And Joshua encouraged Caleb. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 11, Paul encouraged Mark. In Acts, Paul and Silas encouraged the guard. And the list goes on. But the point is made. Others can be encouraged by your faith and your faith in them. And then lastly... To be an encourager means you've got to make sure that they don't quit. Have you ever felt at some time in your life that you just wanted to quit? That you just wanted to give up? Say, what's the use? I know, every time you go out the door to work every morning, you know, I can't deal with this anymore. Listen to this. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 14, then I'll be about done. The Thessalonica church was struggling. Paul had started it and it was going well, then all of a sudden it started going. <sniffs> Paul got word the church was really getting downhearted because it be, they began to squabble and disagree and didn't have a vision and on and on and on. And the church wasn't doing anything. And Paul wrote in verse 14, And we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage Encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient with all men. Paul is saying, come on. Come on now. Encourage each other, and we'll get through this. Encourage, church. Encourage each other. Believe in each other. Paul said that you're faint-hearted. That wasn't a bad thing. He was just saying that when you get your spirit so down... You know, how many has ever been 
in a church where your spirits were so down. Paul said, encourage them, encourage them. Earlier, we sang a song called Old Rugged Cross. Oh, it was good. It was pretty. Thank you. It reminded me of a service some years ago when an elderly man in our church had the special. Now, I'd be lying if I told you that poor old fellow could sing. He couldn't sing to save his soul. But then I'm reminded of something my mother said to me one time. <laughs> He's not singing to you. <laughs> Do anybody know what that means? You know? It didn't matter on which side I sat with my mother. I got it either way, you know. Don't talk to her. Don't laugh. Don't, you know, I'm surprised she had her arms are this big around. This guy got up and sang the old rugged cross. I'd heard it a thousand times. He was no songbird. But even as a boy, I, 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 can, I can remember us singing it in church, but there was something different about this guy. He got up and he sang it, and he blessed our hearts. I'm telling you, we were so encouraged by what he sang. Now, as he sang the old rugged cross, tears began to run down that old guy's face. I'll never, I'll never forget it. He kept wiping the tears. He'd sing a little bit, then he'd weep a little bit. He'd sing a little, little bit, and he'd weep a little bit. Sing and weep. This went on. Finally, he got done. And there wasn't a dry eye in the house because they all cried with him because the words of the old rugged cross that, that reaches deep within a person. You know, he couldn't sing, but I'll tell you what. You could tell that he'd been to Calvary. You could tell he'd been to Calvary, and Calvary had changed his life. You could tell that the Lord had blessed him abundantly, and his life was so much different now than what it used to be. We didn't know anything about this man's previous life, but I could tell that he had been to Calvary. So let me ask you, he got what he needed. Are you getting what you need? That, there's nothing else said about this man who came, as paralytic it came, other than he got up, <laughs> rolled up his, whatever you call it, that contraption that they made. It doesn't say anything about what happened to the four friends. It just said he got up and he left there glorifying God. And I can imagine going all the way home going, glory to God, glory to God. You know, I mean, he's, he's got his legs back. But the real heroes of the story, I appreciate so much that he got healed. But the real heroes of the story are four friends that gave up their time and their love and their faith to make sure this guy could get to Jesus. Are you an encourager? That was Living Faith with Dr. Charles Baxter, recorded live at Christ Community Church, 1364 North Hillcrest Road, Vincennes, Indiana. Sunday school at 930, church service at 1030. Christ Community Church, Vincennes, Indiana.